Thanks, Chris. Morning, everyone. Great to see you. Um, just want to, um, he's still going, isn't he? Just want to start with a, a comment this morning. Um, we, we take the preaching of, of the words uh, very seriously here, and um, we, uh, we, we team it together on our, our preachers. Um, we, we check in with one another ahead of each preach, and um, do- preaching doctrine is, is important. And so we're in reviewing of our preachers, uh, we realize that uh, something has been said that's not true. Um, that's, that's important, and uh, we have to examine that. And, um, and so I just wanted to air this point. When, when I was preaching a few weeks ago, um, somewhat regretfully, I, I did in fact say that um, Nottingham Forest are about to get relegated. <laughs> and um, it turns out that that's actually not happening. And um, I, I confess it's probably because my team were in a similar situation a few years back and just tumbled right down. And um, so, hey, it's good news for the city, isn't it? Yes, there we go. Um, I thought you might also uh, find it fun t- um, to know that um, the River Church Newcastle that we started out of here three years ago um, is going really, uh, really well as well. Um, Emma and I were uh, with those guys last week, and um, they are in a, um, a community, um, a, a, like a town hall, um, just east of Newcastle Town Centre, uh, going really well. The team are really encouraged. They're meeting in, in that venue every week. Uh, they've got about 30 or 35 of them, kind of including kids around, and um, given, you know, three years ago, but a large chunk of that being COVID. It just is excellent. They've got this wonderful um, group of um, uh, kind of young adult women in the church that um, are just absolute kind of quality people, love, love the Lord and just serving them really well. There's all the Geordie accents going uh, around the room as well. And it's just a beautiful thing to see. So um, yes, they are, doing, they are doing well and send their love. I want to start this morning with, um, with two questions. And these are questions that you hear asked all the time. These are questions that um, those of us that know Jesus ask. These are those that uh, people wouldn't call themselves followers of Jesus ask. And they are the questions, where's God when it hurts? And where's God when I pray, right? Where, where's God in the pain of all of the world? Is one of the most common questions that gets asked. And when I pray, which isn't just Christians, you know, the data tells us that all sorts of, of, of people of all kinds of convictions pray, where, where's God when I pray? And um, the passage that we are in, in our Romans 8 series um, this morning, I think has some fascinating answers on those two questions. So we're going to dive straight into it. It's Romans chapter 8. Um, we're up to verse 26 and 27. And I think you'll see how the way that God's been speaking to us in our worship time um, is already kind of joining up with what this passage is going to encourage us with. So here's what it says. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. You may or may not know that it is Pentecost Sunday today. And um, uh, that celebrates um, God himself by his spirit, the Holy Spirit being poured out on the people of God, that he lives amongst us um, by his spirit. And so it's apt that um, the passage today and and thus we in our preaching get to talk about the Holy Spirit today, the, the third person of the Trinity. So if you're new to faith, God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three persons, one God. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Spirit and the Spirit is not the Father, but there is one God, that in the persons of the Godhead, there is one will, there is one mind, that the Father wants the same things the Son wants, he wants the same things the Spirit wants, that in their personality, that is their their character, that there there is a oneness uh, uh, um, uh, about who the persons of the Godhead are. And actually, we've seen Paul talk about the work of the Holy Spirit already an awful lot in in what we've covered um, in the the series so far in in the last few weeks. So we've seen how God, the Holy Spirit, takes the finished work of Jesus and applies it to our hearts, uh, leaving us free from all condemnation. We've seen how he unites us uh, to Christ. We've seen how uh, God, the Holy Spirit, indwells us, that we can have hope because we know God is living uh, within us, that he reminds us of the new reality of coming to know him now, that we're different people now, that he empowers the Christian life. We've seen all sorts, haven't we? We've seen a few weeks ago how he He testifies to the fact that we are children of God, that there's this cry of Abba, 
that comes from it. Sometimes that, that can get translated daddy, but I think even that's kind of too, too developed. It's more primitive than that. I, I remember um, when uh, Emma and I's kids were young, we had this, um, this little kind of competition as to whether they could say my name first or Emma's name first, uh, daddy or mummy. And of course, it was instigated by, by me because the D sound is way easier than the M sound. So I knew that I was in for a winner on this one. So there I was desperately trying to kind of get them. And then what came out was not daddy, but dada. It's, it's very, very primitive. And, and the sound is intended not just to, to say, kind of, oh, daddy, I want you to do something, as much as just convey a, a little baby holding their arms aloft and say, dada. What we're saying the Holy Spirit does is, is it just brings about the sense of us of God, father, daddy, dada. We just want you. That's what he does in our lives. And then last week, as um, Sarah was speaking so excellently, we looked at how Paul locates the difficulties that we see in this life, in the unfinished story of God's plan, that for both creation and for ourselves, that the brokenness and the hurt and the pain that we see will one day be met with a glorious healing, a glorious restoration, that the journey, as Sarah's illustration was last week, the whole journey will have been worthwhile, that we have hope because we know the ending. And likewise, Paul says, the very first word, likewise, that is in the meantime, in the in-between, between the kind of pain of the everyday and the restoration of all things, Paul describes our weakness. So the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. That is in our present existence. So how Tim Keller defined it as our entire human situation of frustrated longings as we await future glory. He helps us in those moments. Now, by and large, our culture is not a fan of weakness, is it? We tend to try and do two things with weakness as a society. We either try and avoid it, so you get celebrities with carefully curated social media profiles, you get politicians trying to like manage the media, perhaps it's the more traditional kind of stiff upper lip, like I will pretend that I am fine, Maybe it's the, the couple of cultural values that are, are so prevalent of reputation, which is about avoiding the perception of weakness, or comfort, which is about avoiding the pain of weakness. That's why those opening questions make so much sense, isn't it? Where's God when it hurts? Where's God when I pray? We try and avoid weakness, or if we don't do that, then we tend to give weakness the last and final word, don't we? And that's where victim culture comes from. You know, this... this Oh, that's jazzy. This, this sense that, this kind of victim culture sense of these circumstances that are true of me define my reality so much, it's so inescapable that I'm just going to let them define everything of who I am. We avoid it or we give it the last word. But as we're here in our worship, the, the Bible sees weakness much better than that. Firstly, it's, it's centered on the Jesus who was vindicated in his moment of greatest pain on the cross right? You found victory in defeat, strength in weakness. And then second, secondly, the scriptures recognize the, the reality of our trials, but then they occasion them as the very ground of God's promised help. It says that God helps us in, not in spite of our weakness. That our weaknesses are the place in which we most get to know and grow in Jesus. And so it says, says, and it's the Holy Spirit who helps us in our weakness. He helps us. It's, it's the same word as that story in Luke chapter 10. Mary and Martha, you know, Jesus is there. Mary's sitting at his feet. Martha's scurrying around, trying to get everything ready, all the food prep. And, and she's kind of shouting out like, Jesus, you need to do something. I desperately need assistance here. You need to send Mary to come and help me. It's the same word, help. We can feel like that coming. I desperately need assistance. You need to do something. And the good news is that he does. And you know, we, we have to remember that is ultimately him who does in our very developed world, don't we? You know, it is not ultimately extra training or sound advice or understanding ourselves better that help us in our weakness, right? Like those things are really good tools. I'm a fan of all of those things, but they're not life givers. There's no life in, the, in, in and of themselves. It's not things that numb pain that help us in our weakness. It's not food or alcohol or social media use. No, God himself wants to help you in your weakness. 
And whilst, of course, we, we recognize his kindness in providing tools like medicine, the internet, people to guide you, in our weaknesses, we really have to ask the question, how's our relationship with God? Because that's where the life is. And so it could be today that you're struggling with sickness or frustrated in your job or your lack of money or maybe the relationships in your life feel like a source of real disappointment to you right now. And there might be some very practical things that you need to do. But I tell you what, it's knowing the sufficiency of Jesus in your life that undergirds them all. Because if you don't know that, then you just keep operating out of your insecurities, don't you? You just keep using the tools because they can change a few things about you, but they can't ultimately bring you life. It's the Holy Spirit who wants to help you. So I wonder where in your life today do you need to look to God rather than just trying to solve it all yourself? I was absolutely nailed by that question, even just a couple of days ago. I was trying to, in fact, it was yes, two days ago. I was trying to fix something. I couldn't do it. I got very down on myself. I totally looked inward. I got nowhere. Now, God wants to help you in your weakness. But then Paul goes on. There's a particular weakness, a particular area of weakness that, that he draws out, and it flows out of living in this unfinished story, in this fallen world. He says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for, so that's in, in particular, we do not know what to pray for as we ought we do not know what to pray for. I'd be a bit, a bit, let me be honest with my reaction this week. I, I didn't quite get that. I, I, read, I was like, Lord, but I've been a Christian now for many years. Like, haven't you taught me how to pray? Aren't there prayers that you've given me in the Bible so that I do know what to pray? And as I just went, went for a, a walk with the Lord and kind of just processed some of these things, what I realized is all of those things are true, of course but only because of the work of the Holy Spirit in, in my life. And what I realize is that any appeal to myself or my own merits very quickly leads me to recognize that by myself, I am nothing but a little child holding his arms aloft, crying out, Dada, with very little idea what to do. I don't even know what I want, let alone the will of God. Yeah, by myself, I can pray some things completely out of sync with the will of God for my life. Anyone identify with that? Yeah, I'm sure we all can. I pray some dumb stuff. I mean, I suspect if you listed my top 10 prayers that I had prayed in my life, far too near the top would be, God, please, would you change, change the traffic lights? <laughs> like, is that the will of God for my life? Or is that just about my comfort? God, would you help my football team? I gave up on that one. And just pray some selfish things. I can pray some things that just aren't what God wanted for me. I think there's countless jobs that I've prayed God would put me into. Areas that I've prayed he'd send me to base myself. Girls that I pray would say yes to me asking them out before I met my wife. And, and, and those things are not bad in themselves, but the whole point is that I had no idea if they were the will of God for me or not. You know, you, I'm sure we can all identify. You get that request in on the home group WhatsApp group, don't you? Would you pray for Situation X? And we all, because we're very nice and family together and this is the right thing to do, go, yes, of course, I will pray for you. But if we were being a little bit truer, probably our response would be, well, if it's in the Bible, of course, we'll know how to pray. But otherwise, we ain't really got a clue what the will of God is. So we'll just pray and see, Right? And the reason that we don't know is because the story is unfinished. The full glory is still to be revealed. The reason that we don't know the will of God is that we're, we're mortal. We're works in progress. We're still learning. Our salvation isn't complete yet. We can't discern the good that God is always working, that it says in verse 28. What we need is someone to step in and help us which is what the Holy Spirit does. Some years back, I was, um, I was in a, um, a bar in, um, on Trent Bridge, uh, it was Embankment, I think it's called Brew House now or something. And it was a Saturday night, there was music, there was dancing, there was a dance floor. It's, um, it's not my uh, 
context of greatest thriving, is it, Emma Joy? Um, I have very little um, idea what to do, so I often kind of spend my time sort of just merrily looking around, trying to pass the time until it's an acceptable time to go home. And, um, and as I was there merrily looking around, suddenly what I discovered was a very muscular man right in front of my face. And it turned that I had been merrily looking around in the wrong direction, who knew? And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm here, he's here, I'm here, he's here, and um, what do I do? At which point, I was so glad that two equally muscular men, Chris Key, who is now part of King's Church Birmingham, and Rick Lusmore, who went to plant the River Church, stepped in and removed me from the situation <laughs> and sorted it out. Sometimes we need someone to step in and help us. Because of myself, I am merrily going along in life, a spiritual child just holding his arms aloft saying, Dada, I just want you. And even that's only the work of the Holy Spirit, by the way. But what the Holy Spirit does is that he fills me with a new heart that actually wants to honor God. And he covers me by course correcting my prayers into the will of God. And he changes me so that I learn to pray in line with his will. That's what Paul's saying here. And Paul uses two words to describe that experience. He says, we don't know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings. Too deep for words. He intercedes and he groans. Now, we've got to remember that the Holy Spirit has already been mentioned 16 times in, in the passage. So there's already lots of his activity that Paul has described. That's what we summarized at the start. But now it says that the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us. I wonder what you think that means. He asks for us. He stands in the gap and fights our case. Actually, it's the only time in all of the New Testament where the intercession of the, the Holy Spirit is referred to. And do you know in Romans chapter 8, we have two intercessors? We have, as Pastor T.J. Timms puts it, Jesus Christ, in verse 34, seated at the right hand of God, who points to his wounds in answer to our every sin. And we have the Holy Spirit enthroned on our hearts, who intercedes for us with the very things that we don't even know we need to pray for. He knows the will of God because he is God. And God has one will. The Father wants what the Son wants, wants what the Spirit wants. They're of one mind. And that's what Paul's saying in verse 27 when he says, and he who searches hearts, that's a description of God the Father several times in the Old Testament. There's one time in the New Testament where Jesus is referred to as searching hearts in the book of Revelation. But mostly it's, it's talking about God the Father. So the Father knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because there's one mind in God, one will in God, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints, that's us, that's the people of God, according to the will of God. Let me put it like this. Before I was um, on staff here, I, I used to be a lawyer and um, was in um, an area called wills and probate. And if you don't know what that is, writing wills for people um, when they pass away. And probate is to do with um, sorting out a person's finances or administration um, when, when they've died. And, um, and I had an excellent boss uh, in, in that job. His, his name was Duncan. I had all the respect for him. He treated people incredibly well. And so what would happen would be that um, I, I'd begin to kind of get to know him and the world of, of wills and probate. And then I would begin to fill out these forms to do with a person's life and assets and with the aim of submitting them to a place called the probate registry. And we were trying to get this document that you can then give to banks and what have you. And it means you can get hold of the money and give it to the person that the will says uh, or the law says that they're supposed to go to. And um, when I started out these forms, I had very little idea what I was doing. I had the sort of dangerous student level of law training of knowing a few things, but being completely blissfully unaware of what it is that I did not know. And so I was in a dangerous place. So I would kind of fill, fill the forms out and, you know, all the assets and the value of the house is straightforward, but personal possessions. I mean, do you count the dog? You know, it, does the dog have a financial value? What if it's like some prize breed or something? You know, what do you do? And I would fill these forms out 
And then I, I would give them in to my boss, Duncan, and he would correct them, and then together, we would send them into the probate registry. And the whole point is that before starting that employment, before that was my new reality, I had very little inclination to fill out these forms. That was not what I wanted to be doing. But now it was my new reality. I wanted to do it. And now that was my new reality, what I found was that Duncan covered me. He course corrected me to get it right. And as I began to do it, I began to get better at it. I know what the questions were asking and what the law was, which meant that I was more able to put the right things in. And the whole thing works because both Duncan and the probate registry are of one mind. That is the law of England and Wales. They're, they're under the, the, the same kind of values. And what Paul's saying here is that God will always take the heart, the core of what we pray, but with the Spirit's course correction, so that we are always heard according to his will. Is what Pastor TJ Timms again says, God intercedes with God. Or C.H. Dodd, the divine in us appeals to the divine over us. Or Tim Keller, the Spirit puts his prayers to the Father inside our prayers. Let me illustrate it like this. If, imagine if God was to give us everything we asked for in prayer. Think a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah? I suppose like the baby with arms outstretched asking for a knife... We can always think when we pray that what we're asking for is a good thing, right? We don't have a private, oh, I know that's not right, so I'm not going to ask for it. We, we, we pray for what we think is good. And yet, as the murmurs in the room indicated, if God gave me everything in my life that I had asked for, it would be an absolute disaster. I mean, Stoke City would be Champions League winners. But that side, it would be a total disaster. Because we don't know what he wants fully. We can't see as he sees. Our desires are skewed and warped and ill-informed. But imagine this. Imagine if we did know all that he knows. Imagine if we did see as God sees. Imagine if we were able to pray perfectly in line with his will. Imagine if the Father gave us everything that we asked for then. That would make much more sense, wouldn't it? That we're praying in line with his will. And this is what Paul is saying now happens because of the Spirit's intercession. And I don't know about you, but that blew my mind this week. It's sometimes I can have a view of prayer that I'm just firing it up to heaven and see if I've got it right and hopefully it grows over time. Now this is saying the Holy Spirit interceding for me, course corrects me into the will of God, taking the core prayer that I pray and meaning it's heard by God in line with his will. And sometimes that looks like the answer yes from the words that I have uttered. Sometimes that looks like the answer no or wait from the words that I have uttered. But as with the baby being refused the knife, the perfect will of God is going on for our good. Isn't that incredible? Wow. My son, who's four, has been learning to swim recently, and um, uh, on the occasions that I've, I've been with him, we've gone into the pool and he's hated the whole experience, apart from when he gets to jump in. This is the bit that he loves. And he doesn't just do a little jump. He absolutely throws himself at, at me. And I, wow, I have to really catch him sometimes. But because I am there, he knows that he has the freedom, the incentive to absolutely go for it. And sometimes he barely makes it off the side and I have to grab him. Sometimes he launches it and I'm catching him up here. But the, the, the whole point is that because I am there, he knows he's got the incentive to go for it. And it's a little bit like the Holy Spirit interceding for us because he brings this course correction into the will of God. That means that we don't need to get it spot on when we pray, right? We don't need to use certain qualifying words or formulae that like some kind of spiritual slot machine, like triggers, ka you've won in the spirit. You don't just add in the name of Jesus onto a prayer and suddenly God has to act because it might not be in the name and the will of Jesus. 
You don't only get heard if you pray the right thing. God's not thinking, oh, they asked for angels again and that's nowhere in the scriptures and so, well, I'm, not gonna, I'm gonna completely ignore it. No, the spirit sees, it, it takes the heart of our prayer, course correct into the will of God, which means we are heard in line with the will of God. And I don't know about you, but that is a huge incentive to pray, that God looks on the heart, that he just wants to commune with me, that that same cry of, Dada, I just want you, is echoed with, I want relationship with you as well. I promise that my will will happen over your life because I've sent my spirit to bring your prayers in line. But we can go further than that because it says here that the spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Verse 22, last week we we saw that creation itself is groaning in the unfinished story. And then the very next verse, verse 23, we saw that we ourselves groan, longing for the completion of God's plan. But here now we find God himself groaning. It's a bit of a funny idea, isn't it? Groaning is a funny word. It's not talking about tongues, actually. Sometimes some people go there on this passage. I don't think that's what it's referring to. Tongues is something we do. This is talking about the the Holy Spirit groaning. Equally, sometimes we can think kind of moaning, you know, like moaning and groaning, you know, and they they go together. And whilst actually the, the root of the word can often be associated with pain, what it's talking about is more the depths from which something is expressed. So groaning or eager longing, it talks about in verse 19, is a cry from the deepest core of a person's being. And in New Testament times, it was used very commonly in two particular uh, scenarios. It was used of um, women in labor, groaning in in those days, very real danger of death, and yet knowing the joy that awaited them. A cry from deep within them. And it was used as soldiers on the battlefield where the fight had ended, but the injured soldiers remained, groaning from the depths of their soul, knowing their bravery, but crying out for assistance because they knew that their life was likely now coming to an end. What Paul's trying to say is that there cannot be any deeper expression than this word groaning. He's saying that as the Holy Spirit does his intercessory work, what we see is that in the very depths of his being, in the one mind of God, his longing is for you. For you to be conformed to the image of his son, of the son of the father, Jesus. That's what verse 28 says. It says that the Holy Spirit intercession is not apathetic. It's not reluctant. So I say, oh, I've got to do this because they keep praying wrong, praying the wrong thing. By saying it's his delight that from the very core of his being, he longs for you to be made more like Jesus. As we pray, there is a cry that issues from the very core of God to fill us, to cover us, and to change us in order that we might know him more. That's incredible, isn't it? And whilst God himself is not in pain, let's be clear, that word groaning does remind us that he did step into this arena of pain, incarnate in the person of his son, Jesus Christ, that he did experience all of the frustrated longings of humanity, that he birthed the church on the cross, that he himself fought the ultimate battle as he cried out from the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What's he doing there? He's quoting Psalm 22. He's quoting the first line, symbolic of the whole psalm. And that psalm then after after those words goes on to say, why are you so far from saving me? From the words of my groaning. There's the word. And as we groan in pain, he knows what it's like. His spirit groans with affection for you as you experience the pain of this world. His intercession covers you. So you say, well, where's God in the pain? Where's God when I pray? He's right there with you, embracing your outstretched arms 
like the good father that he is, working for your good as he brings his plan to completion and helping you to pray. Why don't we have the band up?